Hey there, practitioners. Have you ever questioned the reliability or accuracy of the urinary organic acid test? Thousands of practitioners are running it and they're using it to make clinical decisions and nutritional interventions in their patients and their clients. But how accurate is it really? Well, we're going to take a quick look at that today by looking specifically at some of the citric acid cycle metabolites that are found off of a urinary organic acid test. So let's take a quick look. If you're watching this video, first of all, you're familiar probably with the urinary organic acid test. There are a number of different labs that offer this test. We're not going to talk about any one of the particular labs because that doesn't matter. Now, just real quickly, understand where urine comes from in the first place. The kidneys are filtering all the blood in the body all the time. And if there's anything in the blood that the body doesn't need, it tends to filter it out the kidneys and is found in the urine. And that's what we're testing in the urinary organic acid test is urine metabolites that are from a number of different biochemical processes in the body. Now, specifically, we're going to look today at the, I think everybody's favorite, is the citric acid cycle metabolites. They are things like citrate here, uh, cisaconitate, uh, isocitrate, alpha-ketoglutarate, succinate, fumarate, and malate. Now, we can measure most of these in the urine um, and uh, comes from the citric acid cycle, or so we think. So here's an example of some citric acid cycle metabolites on one particular lab. Here's some citric acid cycle metabolites on a different lab. They run slightly different ones. Again, it doesn't matter about that part. We're going to look at are these accurate or not. Mostly, we're going to look at succinate for no particular reason, although you could do this with any of them. First and foremost, and this may seem rudimentary, but where does the citric acid cycle take place in the first place? It happens inside the mitochondria. That we know of, that's it. What does it do? It creates electrons to donate to the electron transport chain to make ATP. We want to keep the citric acid cycle metabolites inside the mitochondria as much as we possibly can. We can't have this stuff leaking out because then ATP production might uh, be damaged in some way. So it happens inside the mitochondria. But here's the question. How many mitochondria do we have per cell in the body? Well, clearly it's estimates and it's going to vary by some degree. But anywhere between hundreds and thousands of mitochondria per cell, depending on the cell. Now, the next question becomes, and how many cells are there in the human body? And again, this is just an estimate, but let's just conservatively say that there's tens of trillions of cells in the body, each that has hundreds to maybe thousands of mitochondria, depending on the person, depending on the cell, depending on a number of different factors. Okay, that's a lot of mitochondria. And each one of those mitochondria have the citric acid cycle, at least a number of citric acid cycles, going on simultaneously all the time. Now, perhaps what's most important is that the mitochondria has two membranes. And really, this inner mitochondrial membrane here, this one is said to be relatively impermeable, which, again, makes sense. If you are making ATP inside of the mitochondria, you don't want stuff to be leaking out. And so we want, we want to have a relatively impermeable inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay, so put all these things together. Number one, we have tens of trillions of cells in the body. Each of them has hundreds to maybe thousands of mitochondria, each that are doing many cycles of the citric acid cycle all simultaneously, but they're trapped inside a supposedly impermeable inner mitochondrial membrane. Now, there are transporters for certain things, but those are transporters and things aren't just spilling out randomly. So my first postulate is that the citric acid cycle metabolites in urine might be from damaged cells when you really think about this, okay? Think about the journey that any one of the citric acid cycle metabolites has to go through. First of all, it has to get out of the mitochondria. That's going to be hard because the inner mitochondrial membrane is so darn impermeable. But then once it's in the extracellular fluid inside of a cell still, it has to get past the phospholipid bilayer membrane. A lot of things can't just sneak past that very easily. So it has to get out of the cell. Then once it's out of the cell, it goes into the interstitial fluid, then it gets dumped into the blood, it gets circulated throughout the body, it gets filtered throughout the kidneys, and then finally gets dumped into the urine. Now that's a long way for citric acid cycle metabolites to go to be catch, caught in urine and then make clinical determinations about that, but we're not done. For example, if the citric acid cycle metabolite is high or low on a test, is it possible that some tissues have low levels of one, like citrate, and massively are spilling because they're damaged cells, or other tissues have high levels of citrate but are not being damaged, okay, what's the net result of that going to be in the urine and the long journey that they have? For example, let's just say, let's say the blood-brain barrier was permeable to succinate. Uh, neuronal cells have high citrate and low succinate, but liver cells have low citrate and high succinate. What are we really measuring when we do this? We say, well, you have low succinate, you're probably deficient in some B vitamins or maybe magnesium or something. But let's look at the literature. I think the literature is a good place to look. This says systemic succinate homeostasis and local succinate signaling affect blood pressure and modify risks for 
calcium oxalate kidney stones. From this paper, they say that succinate may, now this is different, may function as an essential extracellular signaling molecule, not just a part of the citric acid cycle. It may have different roles in the body. Interesting. There are succinate receptors, and not even that, there are succinate transporters, okay, for, by the way, extracellular succinate. And extracellular succinate is what's found in the blood and what's filtered in the urine and what ends up in the citric acid cycle of urinary organic acid test. Check out the title of this paper, Rethinking Succinate. What a wonderful idea. This is directly from this paper. We now know that extracellular levels of succinate are both relevant and dynamic. Interesting. Extracellular levels of succinate transiently increase in response to acute physiological adaptations such as exercise, food ingestion, and cold exposure. So you're telling me that if I do my urinary organic acid test and I exercise or I eat, or maybe I have had some recent cold exposure, that might affect my succinate levels? By contrast... Chronic inflammatory metabolic disorders are associated with a persistent elevation of extracellular succinate, extracellular succinate, which boosts the inflammatory response and even disturbs its physiological function. They go on to say, the source of this circulating succinate remains elusive. Well, that's a bummer. But both peripheral tissues and gut microbiota might contribute. Okay, this is circulating extracellular succinate that's in the blood and is going to be filtered in the urines and end up in the urine and we don't know where it comes from, but it might be because of peripheral tissues and gut microbiota. Well, that's not super helpful. In addition to that, in infected urine samples, gram-negative bacteria and gram-positive cocci infected urine samples could be differentiated by certain citric acid cycle metabolites like succinate. For example, check this out. Succinate had really high levels in the urine, by the way, when there was gram-negative bacteria but not gram-positive cocci. Might that be influencing the results on a urinary organic acid test? They went on to say there's a whole bunch of different bacteria that it produces urinary succinate. So my second postulate is, is that we actually have no idea where the urinary citric acid cycle metabolites are coming from, and therefore making a clinical decision or nutritional intervention based upon them is just simply not responsible. You can't say looking at the citric acid cycle metabolites on a urinary organic acid test that somebody is deficient in B vitamins or magnesium or they have aluminum toxicity or whatever it might be because if you go back to the journey of these citric acid metabolites, they go through, they have to get out of the mitochondria and they have to get out of the, of the, the cell into the intracellular fluid, into the blood and then be filtered. There's also extracellular uh, succinate, for example. There's receptors for these. There's transporters for these. Some cells might be spilling a lot. Other cells might not be spilling any. We don't know. And then all of a sudden on a single urinary test, we say, oh, your citrate, citrate is high and your succinate low is low. Therefore, blank. I don't think it's reasonable to think that citric acid cycle metabolites in the urine reflects a micronutrient deficiency or mitochondrial dysfunction or even toxin exposure the way uh, some are, are leading us to believe. But that's just how I read the evidence. I'd love to hear what you think. And when you're done with that, head over to Clinician's Code, where we have these kind of conversations and a lot more while we help practitioners build confidence, cut overwhelm, and become more successful in functional medicine.